After the United States expands its influence in the world, it has a place at the world stage, whether it likes it or not. The United States has always tried to follow a policy of neutrality, yet in order to open new markets, they violate that policy in many cases. When it comes to World War I, it wasn't something the United States wanted to get involved in, but eventually we did. And it is my opinion that it is the United States American expansion mentality that makes that decision more and more inevitable. Some long-term causes of World War I that have little to do with the United States itself. You can see on this map colorations that show an alliance system in Europe. The Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy controls much of Central Europe. Then you can see the Triple Entente of Britain, France, and Russia. Now, at this time, Germany is a developing industrial nation. They're really just coming into their own kind of like the United States was in the late 1800s. And they see the alliance system surrounding them, the Triple Entente of Britain, France, and Russia, as a major threat. And Germany, therefore, is the most nervous and the most on edge and the most likely to cause something like World War I to happen. Now there's a catalyst that causes the outbreak of World War I. And that snowball effect of the outbreak happened very, very quickly. Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire is assassinated by a Serbian nationalist while touring Sarajevo. That Serbian nationalist's name was Gavrilo Princip. And Princip's assassination of Franz Ferdinand set in motion a series of events that was practically unstoppable. The Austro-Hungarians mobilized their army immediately for an invasion of Serbia in response to Princip's assassination of Ferdinand. Now, Russia is an ally of Serbia. So they immediately mobilized their army to defend their ally against Austria-Hungary, which causes Germany to mobilize its army in response to Russia, because they're an ally of Austria-Hungary. Pretty soon, there's a full-scale war underway, because all of the nations in the Triple Alliance and Triple Entente have mobilized their armies, and they're ready to fight each other. So this assassination, which would seem like a random act to spur a massive world war, really does. That one act. Here is Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie, just before they are assassinated, and Gavrilo Princip is in the bottom left after his arrest. At first, the United States remained neutral from 1914 to 1916. Throughout that time, the United States aided the British and the French through war loans. So they're aiding the Triple Entente. They didn't really give too much aid to Russia, mainly Britain and France. But, eventually, numerous issues get the U.S. involved. For example, unrestricted submarine warfare. This is when U.S. trading vessels entering British waters are being sunk by the Germans. And we negotiated a stop to the unrestricted submarine warfare, but right around the time of the issuing of the Zimmerman telegram, we um, saw an uptick in unrestricted submarine warfare all over again. The Zimmerman telegram released around that same time of the increased sinking of U.S. trading vessels, was a letter, essentially, 
from German diplomats to Mexican diplomats trying to convince Mexico to declare war on the US. So they essentially wanted Mexico to preoccupy the United States in a war on this side of the globe to keep them out of possibly ending up in the European conflict. Well, it kind of backfires because we intercept the telegram and it makes us mad enough to uh, move towards going to war with Germany and therefore their ally Austria-Hungary. The additional factor here that's a little less directly connected to the United States is the revolution in Russia. When Tsar Nicholas II in Russia is overthrown by the Bolsheviks and his whole family is murdered and the Bolsheviks take control, they immediately pull Russia out of the war. And that makes Britain and France very vulnerable because now Germany only has one front to fight the war on. If you go back and look at the map of the alliance system, you can see that closing off this front of the war after Russia is pulled out allows Germany and Austria-Hungary to focus all of their energies on overrunning France. How the United States mobilized and prepared itself to help win the war in Europe. The entire American economy and society is completely focused and dedicated to winning the war. And that means that factories started prioritizing military goods over consumer goods. So instead of producing things that people would buy for their home, those goods become unavailable for a while because they're producing uh, military hardware. Women and minorities need to fill the void of the men in those factory jobs because the men had been deployed to Europe. And when I say men, I mean white men because it's not just women here replacing the white men going overseas, it's minorities as well. The unfortunate thing is when those white troops return home from war, those women and those minorities are out of a job. Also, food supplies were rationed to feed the troops. And if you look at these images on the bottom, you can see ration stamps that were used and with a picture of an early model tank. So your ration stamp, yes, you might have been a little short on things during the war, but this image of the tank was a reminder to you of just why you were rationing. And then this other poster was made to encourage women to do their part to help win the war. Now, winning the war, how is it done? First of all, trench warfare makes World War I the bloodiest war to date. Millions of people die in World War I. Newer weapons like machine guns are meant to help soldiers go on the offensive. Unfortunately, they lead to massive body counts when those weapons are instead used on the defensive in a trench system. This is very similar to when in the Civil War muskets have um, widespread use of rifling in the barrels. Uh, the mini ball uses the rifling in those barrels to become deadly accurate at longer distances. You have artil artillery that is far more accurate in the Civil War and so body counts rose dramatically during the Civil War because tactics were not keeping up with the technology. And likewise, when World War I devolved into a trench warfare war, it also led to a drastic increase in body counts due to the lack of change to strategy to keep up with the new technology. The last big push the Germans try to advance on Paris in March of 1918 in one last all-out offensive. Fresh troops from the United States, however, are able to push them back. It is this manpower from the United States that prevents Germany from possibly winning the war. Yes, our contributions in weapons and in money and in support and in foodstuffs all that is important, but the single most important thing is the fresh troops, the fresh manpower. 
because of all the body counts prior to that point that had exhausted both sides. This image here is a U.S. soldier in the trenches. It is a very elaborate system. Actually, there's another image that shows you the elaborate system. You would not want to be peeking your head up over these trenches. Sharpshooters from the other side would try picking you off. And when offensives took place, each side had a trench system like this, and in the middle was known as no man's land, filled with barbed wire, all sorts of landmines scattered throughout, and that was probably the most deadly situation in the history of warfare. And it's known as no man's land specifically because when people rose up out of the trenches and went to attack the enemy, if the barbed wire didn't slow them down for them to be killed by artillery or gunfire, and if the landmines didn't kill them, those few that were left were probably mowed down by the machine guns at the other end of the battlefield. So this is a major reason why World War I was such a majorly bloody conflict. This is the end of the presentation. Please make sure that you take the online quiz. If you use your notes, you should not have a problem with the online quiz, as long as you've taken good notes. Thank you. See you in class.